It's time once again to slip into your camo, grab your bow, and join us out in the field for another episode of the Up North Journal, presented by PSE Archery. The Up North Journal crew is knocked and ready to rock for another exciting adventure. So let's step outside and hit the trail. This episode of the Up North Journal podcast is brought to you by PSE Archery, Yamaha Outboards, Better the Hunt, Easy Cut, Packer Max, Deer Camp Coffee, Buck Bates, JPO Game Calls, Limwalker Game Calls, Wild Seasoning, Total Peep, Sunrise Archery, Scent Lock, and Scent Blocker. Welcome back to another episode of the Up North Journal, everybody. I'm your host, Mike Adams, sitting in the cabin tonight on a blustery, snowy night <laughs> with Dan DeFall, who finally made it up here. Yeah, no kidding. Talk about uh, going a little slow. Yeah. But I made it in for the first show of 2022. And for the people listening on the podcast, that makes this start the 16th season. Man, I tell you, it just seems like 16 seasons ago we started this. <laughs> <laughs> right? There's been a few. Well, it goes back to what we were asked last year by, I think, Mr. Mark Coleman asked us about writing that book. Mm-hmm. There's a little bit of ups and downs in those 16 seasons. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not all cake and ice cream here, so. You got it. But so. uh, we're going to have fun tonight, for sure. Absolutely. Well, let's take care of some of uh, people who take care of us and get the promo codes that we've got for 2022. With more to come. There you go. So, with that being said, folks, uh, remember... Buck Bates. They've got uh, Deer Camp Outfitters uh, as well. They do have a brick and mortar store in Sterling Heights, Michigan at 15 and Dodge Park. Get down there and go see Julie and the gang down there. And if you use uh, ordering online and you go to buckbates.com and if you do promo code UNJ20, you'll get 20% off your order at checkout. They got some good treats down there in the store too. They got a bunch of new treats in that store. Good Let me deal. tell you that. Uh, and I tell you what, JP game calls we're gonna see them here at the end of the month over on the west side of the state he's making calls frantically um and if you want 10 percent off your order when you check out over there at jpogamecalls.com use the promo code unj10 and tonight wouldn't be amiss if we weren't drinking deer camp coffee and we're drinking wall hanger because it's uh one of those type of nights it's cold and blustery i got it out the strongs there you go and i tell you what use the promo code unj10 over at deercampcoffee.com you'll get 10 percent off your order over there but if you come to my screen now we can take a quick quick peek up in newberry where it is a nice seven degrees and i think it would be time at seven degrees to go over to to cedars and get a pizza and some deer camp cuff that's right i think that's what somebody's doing right now i do see a car on the street right exactly the, the lone car on the street so <laughs> get get over there uh up in newberry check them out go enjoy a pizza there you go well, I tell you what, we got uh, got that out of the way. I say we just jump right into this and we uh, introduce our guest. And tonight we have none other than uh, an avid kayaker out of the Detroit area, Mike Rudell. Mike, what is going on, my man? How you doing? Good. Thanks for having me on. Hey, man. Thanks for being here. It's uh, it's finally putting a name to a face. We talk on Facebook back and forth quite a bit, and uh, you run a, a kayaking page over there. But before we get too deep into this, we want to know a little bit about your background and how did you get started into kayak, and what was the, the, the big push to get into kayaking like you are now? Yeah, you know, I've, I've always really loved the outdoors, um, and I used to do a lot of uh, backpacking and camping and hiking and things like that. And about uh, six years ago, I got into kayaking. I, I saw some people doing it, and I, I rented a boat from a local outfitter, and I got in there, and I just fell in love right away. I, I love the aspect, of, the exercise aspect of it, um, being in nature, and just everything about it I really like. You mentioned the outdoors, so obviously there's a little more to you than just kayaking the, about the outdoors. Actually, we talked a little bit about that before the show. Uh, what are some of the things that you get out and do? Wow. Well, you know, I mean, I, lo- I love to just hike, and uh, I do a lot of trail running. You know, anywhere where there's uh, where there's green space, you'll see me exploring it. So I like to mountain bike a lot as well. Um, you know, canoeing, kayaking, those are kind of my, my main activities. Did you grow up doing that, or is it something you just kind of came into as you got older? 
that's an interesting question. So I'm, I'm a city boy, you know, growing up in Detroit, we didn't have a lot of opportunities for that, but I always had an interest in it. I was always the kid that when mom told us to go outside and play, I took off and I went and found whatever woods were nearby, <laughs> you know? So I've always had a, an, an interest in the, in the outdoors for sure. But as I've um, kind of gotten older and life has just gotten more busy and complicated, it, it's become a refuge for me to kind of get away from everyday life, you know? You know, it, it's we tell people that so much uh, when we try to introduce people into the outdoors, whether it be hunting, fishing, camping, kayaking, whatever. It's They don't understand until they actually they get out there and they're like, wow, you know, man, this is so cool. I Where has this been all my life? It's uh, it, it definitely opens uh, a lot of different possibilities for things that people to, to do that they never even really thought of. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, for me, there, there's a peace and a serenity that comes with it. I mean, we were chatting before the show. Mm-hmm. I feel more at home when I'm out in the woods or in a boat than I do when I'm on land. You know, it's just a, a comforting feeling to be out in nature. Well, it's one of those things when you're out there, uh, wherever you might be out in nature, it's just that solitude that you get and that peace of quiet where you get to the point where your ears start to ring and you're not worried about a semi running you over at <laughs> 75 miles an hour. And, <laughs> yeah, and, right. You know, and it, it just you, then you can sit back and reflect on the week, the month, the year, and you just go into it and you go, this is nice. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Or this time of year, you don't have to worry about getting hit by a snowplow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you know, and speaking of the snow and the cold weather, we're going to get into this a little bit in the next segment, but uh, that's what we're here to talk about tonight is uh, cold water kayaking and cold water safety and the gear that goes along with it. But, uh, you know, kind of getting back to uh, uh, the, how you got started and everything. Uh, so being that, uh, you know, you're, you're in so- southeastern Michigan, uh, I got to imagine that did you start on the rivers? Did you start, uh, you know, Detroit River, or Lake St. Clair? Where, where did you start cutting your teeth on the water? Yeah, so that's a great that's a great question. So when I first, you know, started paddling and I, you know, I realized I liked it. I, I went to a local sporting goods store and bought one of those couple hundred dollar plastic Pelican kayaks. Mm-hmm. And I decided that I was going to paddle on a local river called the Rouge River. You okay. might've heard of like the Rouge plant yep. and, uh, in Melvindale there. And so I, I put in on the Rouge River and I paddled uh, six miles out to the Detroit River. Okay. And I had no idea what I was doing. And as I came into the Detroit River, a huge freighter was coming out of the Rouge plant. And you guys, the, the water was so crazy. The waves were so high. I was absolutely terrified. I could not control this 10 foot kayak. I was spinning around in circles, getting pushed. It's a miracle I didn't flip over. And I remember getting pushed up against Zug Island, which is this like you know, industrial island in the river. And there were these, yeah, these big tires that the ships would park up against. And I grabbed one of those tires with both hands. I, I, I took my paddle apart and put it in the boat and I'm holding this tire and I'm thinking, if I get out of this alive, I got to get a bigger boat. <laughs> so the question I have about that is, you know, you said you, you did canoeing. Yes. Why did you make the jump over to kayak? Was it just the progression or, or how did that work? This is a great question too. So I started as a kayaker. I only recently, about oh. a year and a half ago, got into canoeing. Okay. So you actually went the other way. All right. Yeah. yeah. And I love them both for, for kind of different and the same reasons. Um, canoeing, I mean, for me, I kayak so much that sometimes like my arms and my shoulders will hurt. And you canoeing is a completely different motion. It works different muscles and you can't go as fast. So it sort of forces me to slow down a little bit. And if I'm on a smaller river with a lot of log jams and stuff, a canoe is actually a lot easier to maneuver than a kayak. You can hop right out on top of the log jam if you're adventurous and pull your canoe over and jump right back in a lot easier than you can with a kayak. Okay. So that's a benefit to a kayak or a canoe over a kayak when you're going down a river. Yeah. But yeah. So, so your equipment, we're taking a look at some of your pictures that you sent in for us to show. Like now, okay, so I'm looking at a, a blue kayak now. What, what, what's your equipment there? that you have yeah so and i i brought some gear if you want to see but i guess i can start i'll talk about boats so i have i have three kayaks and a canoe right now and they're all very different and they're for very different things so the picture that you have up the blue boat that is uh what they call a touring or recreational kayak 
And that one is a, um, it's made by a company called Wilderness and it's called a Tsunami. And it's a great boat, uh, Michael shaking his head, 14 and a half feet long. And that thing is great because it's small enough that you can take it on those smaller rivers, but it's also nimble enough and um, fast enough that you can take it out on big water. Mm -hmm. I've had that thing in Lake Erie in two and a half, three foot waves. I've had it on the Detroit River. You can put a lot in that boat and it's, it's very utilitarian. Um, the downside for me, just a guy who likes to go fast, it's not as fast as a sea kayak, you know, but it's very stable and you can put a lot of gear in it. So, um, and it's plastic. So I don't mind dragging it through the woods if I have a long portage or something like that. It's a good all around boat. Okay. So with that being said, you've got the, these kayaks here. A uh, question coming in on the chat from Mark Coleman is, uh, how different, how difficult is it to kayak upstream? when in a creek slash river versus using a canoe yeah so you know people will ask that ask me that and it it kind of depends a lot of it depends on your motor which i mean the person everybody's different some people have that stamina and that energy um i find it's easier to go upstream in a kayak than it is in a canoe okay, okay. Simply, simply put if you're going upstream in a canoe it's a lot more work with a kayak you've got the paddle in both sides of the water whereas the canoe you know you're really only on one side now some people that are really really fast and good canoeists they might be able to keep up with a kayaker going upstream but most people can't well, talking about your getting back to your gear, the uh, your, your red kayak. Yeah, so the red kayak. That's that's uh, her name is Hot Dog. <laughs> and, Got her uh, named. She's named Hot Dog for a couple of reasons. That so that kayak is a Valley Sea kayak. They're they're made in England, and the model is a Serona. And it's a fiberglass boat. It's uh, just over 16 and a half feet long, and it weighs about 53 pounds. Mm -hmm. So it's it's very light and it's very fast. It's not a beginner boat. In fact, when I put people in it that aren't really kayakers, they almost immediately tip or feel like they're going to tip. Right. It's not. It's not. You know. It takes them getting used to. Um, but it's a great boat, and I call her Hot Dog because. She's red on top with a white bottom, and then it has all the deck lines are yellow, so it looks like mustard. Gotcha. So, you know, but also because she's she's really fast. I mean, yeah. you ask my friends that go with me, and I joke about it. Sometimes I can't control it. It just wants to go fast. <laughs> well, you know, if you, if you were with us, then you'd take off and leave us, because I'm always in the back taking photos, looking at nature. Uh, yeah. Nancy's always yelling at me, come on, let's go, let's go. <laughs> so, You're sightseeing. I'm sightseeing, Calm yeah. Down, Nancy. Yeah. So. Uh, okay, but you said you had a third boat as well. Yeah, so so it's that little, um, I don't know if I sent you a picture, but they're, these boats are, are ubiquitous. You see them everywhere. It's a 10-foot plastic boat made by Pelican. It's called a Trailblazer. Okay. And it's a great boat. It's super short, super wide, very stable, mm -hmm. great for small creeks and rivers, but it's not a big water boat. It doesn't track well. It doesn't go straight very well. It takes a lot of effort to move it forward. Um, but you can just really beat it up. I mean, I have dragged that thing through some woods and <laughs> over log jams, uh, you know, so it's it's a great boat for the smaller water. The problem with that boat is, is if you're in water that's over your head and you fall out of that boat, it's almost impossible to get back in. Right. It's just too wide. There's no flotation. So if it fills with water, I mean, there's a little bit of styrofoam in the front, but if that thing fills with water, it's going to sink. Gotcha. Whereas those other two have those closed compartments, those bulkheads that will keep it the boat from sinking, which is important. Okay. Well, that's awesome. Well, I'll tell you what, we're, we've uh, burned about 15 minutes here. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. We come back. I want to kind of, we, we just left off with different boat sizes. Let's use that to kind of springboard into what we're going to use in different situations, cold water. And you mentioned, you know, a beginner getting into a boat uh, such as a sea kayak versus somebody who's seasoned. Uh, we'll talk about some of those things and uh, let's we'll start, start down the road. Or let's start down the river, as they say, <laughs> when we come back. We're going to step outside. We'll be right back after this. PSE Archery has reinvented the way you buy bows. From now on, you can make the most educated decision possible by basing your bow choice specifically on your shooting needs and goals. All you need to do is ask yourself, what kind of shooter am I? What do I want to achieve? PSE will help find the right category for you. So, what kind of shooter are you? Find out at PSEArchery.com.
Welcome back. Second segment of the show. And when we left you, we were talking about different size kayaks, uh, purposes for them, beginners, seasoned, intermediate users. But tonight we really want to maybe use those things to springboard into cold weather kayaking. Exactly. But one of the questions does have to do with size of kayak. And the question is, what size do they consider to be a sea kayak? That's a really great question. So sea kayaks typically, you know, start at 16 feet. That's considered an entry level sea kayak. Some people might, you know, tell you different. Um, What I like to tell everyone, if you're going to go on what I call big water, this is water with current, water that's over your head, that has waves. Um, You want to use a boat. It doesn't necessarily have to be a sea kayak, but you want to use a boat that's at least 12 feet long and that has double bulkheads. And, and there's a couple reasons for that. You know, the, the longer the boat is, the more of it that's in the water, so the easier it is to control. And then having those double bulkheads that are sealed ensures that in the event of a capsize, the cockpit might fill up with water, but that boat's not going to sink. Right. So hopefully that answers that question. Well, you, you brought up a good point that I did not know. Uh, uh, talking about double bulkhead, you know, I've got uh, a pungo, uh, a wilderness pungo, and it's got the one in the back with the sealed bulkhead. Uh, but I didn't realize that you also need one in the front. I mean, which makes sense now that I think about it. For safety's sake, what I always tell people, because people go out there with a single bulkhead. I'm, I don't recommend it. What I tell people to do is on a nice warm summer day, go out into the water, maybe chest deep, have a friend with you, and cu- fall out of that boat and let the cockpit fill up with water. And more than likely, what's going to happen is the end that does not have a bulkhead is going to sink into the water. Gotcha. So you're going to have a, you know, but the only way, you know, for people to see that is to actually try it. Okay. Makes, yeah, well, that's it, right? Sense. Get to know your equipment, knows how how it works and everything, and, and, and go from there. And, and now you've got the boat. But you haven't talked about paddles. You know, are, are paddles important? Or yes, yeah. I'm going to share with you. I have it here. I'll share my paddle. There's lots of different kinds of paddles that you can use. Now, typically, the lighter the paddle, the better it's going to be for you, right? Um, it, it, you're going to have less fatigue and you'll be able to go faster. This is my favorite paddle in the whole world, and I'm not plugging them because, you know, whatever, but it's called a Werner. It's, it's by a company called Werner, and it's called the Caliste, and it's a carbon fiber paddle. And if I remember correctly, it weighs 223 grams. Everyone that I have that picks this thing up goes, I, I can't believe how light it is. Right. And it's, it's a low angle paddle, so it's not going to be as hard on the chest and shoulders. And if you see how big the part of the, the blade is, mm-hmm. you know, a lot, a lot of the rec, recreational paddles are a lot smaller, so you don't get as much in the water. The, you can really fly with something like this and also go for a long distance. Mike and I were talking about paddling, you know, 15, 16, 17 miles. If you do that with a cheaper, heavy paddle, you're really going to feel it as opposed to a lightweight, you know, carbon paddle. Yes, you will. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you will. <laughs> and, and I have a new, uh, I don't have a carbon paddle, but I got a fiberglass one now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's one of those things. I mean, everything in kayaking is expensive. The better the gear, the more it costs. So you just sort of, you, you build your way. I mean, when I started, I just had a $40 paddle, uh, field and stream paddle from Dick's Sporting Goods. And I used that for a year and it worked. Well, that's one, of, that's one of the nicest things about kayaking um, is the entry level price points that you can get just to get out on the water are really affordable for just about everyone. And then from that point on, if you choose you want to go further, hey, yep. sky's the limit, right? Right. Oh, it, re- it really is. Yeah. This, you know, that's a good thing, but it's kind of a scary thing too because some people will see someone like me out on the water in hot dog on the Detroit River looking like he's having the time of his life and then think, hey, for a couple hundred dollars, I can do the same thing. Right. And they don't, they don't realize, you know, the amount of training that goes into that all the safety precautions and i'm a big gear person having the right gear depending on what kind of paddling you're doing so exactly um, you know and and speaking of that um before we get into all the safety things what would be your the question is what is the most important safety tip when solo kayaking because you said you go out there a lot a lot on your own the most important is your pfd your life jacket your personal flotation device i'll show you mine real quick there's, there's lots of different kinds out there. And again, I'm not plugging anyone in particular, but this is, I, I love this one. It's by Kokatat and it's called the Outfit. And it's designed for kayakers. You know, there's different life jackets out there. 
And when I first started, I just had this uncomfortable one that didn't cost a lot, but it really hurt every time I moved my arms and I got a little rash under my arms. This particular one is made for kayakers. It's got a lot of pouches to put different things in there. Um, I also have an emergency water activated light. If I fall in the water, that will turn on so I'm visible. And you know, this is the most important piece of safety gear in my opinion. And it, often people don't wear it. They, they might have it on the boat. I, I say you always have it on. You know, it's something I, I we've talked about, Nancy and I've talked about quite a bit. Uh, you know, people like to match different things to their kayak, the same color. Uh, and and I, my punga was blue. And I was like, I do not want a blue life jacket because you can't see it. If you, if you need to be rescued in the water, like say you're out in, in a big water and you fall overboard and you got a signal coast guard or somebody else to get you, they have a hard time finding you. You're so right, Mike. I'm not a bright color guy, except when it comes to paddling, because you want those bright yellows, those bright reds, those bright oranges, because like you said, you want to be visible. If you're wearing earth tones or you're wearing uh, blues or, or green, green's my favorite color, but you wear those things and it makes you a lot harder to spot in the event of a rescue. Absolutely. We have went so far as putting uh, reflective tape on the blades or on the handle of our paddles, uh, just another thing that, that a, a potential rescue person could see and help to find you as well. So, yeah, you know, when you're when you're when you're going out there to, to, to purchase all this stuff, um, another question I'm, I'm seeing, um, what is the average um, lifespan of a kayak? Is there a lifespan? Are they indefinite or, or what would you say? Hey, I've been using this for X amount. Maybe I should look into a new one. I mean, I guess that's personal. All of my boats are have dents, cracks, and scratches, but it's because I use them. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're not show pieces. They're not sitting, you know, um, but they work. So, and even a cheap kayak, I mean, my cheapest one, it, it's, it was well made and, and it, it does well. So, I mean, as long as it's not leaking and you, you can paddle it, you know, or it's not broken, it works like you want. I, I, I can't really put a you know, um, I know people who paddle 25, 30 year old sea kayaks that do just fine. So, I mean, my canoe that I have is 40 years old and it's a great canoe. So it, it sounds like to me, like, like, like in typical fashion, if you take care of your equipment, it'll last. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there is some maintenance and I'll tell you, I am, I'm not somebody who likes to like do this stuff, but you, you learn how to maintain your boats and the things that you do. I carry a small toolkit that has a Leatherman and I have wrenches and screwdrivers to adjust the bolts and the straps and things like that. And you just learn how to do that as you get more into paddling. Yeah. Well, and Jim says here, he says, the problem often is that someone doesn't know what they don't know. And that that's part of the learning process of what you're talking about. Uh, yes. And, that, and that's one thing we want to, like I said, we want to impart tonight is about this cold weather stuff. Cause I've, I've done a little bit, I mean, just a little bit of cold water paddling and, and you, you, uh, seems like you're out almost every day when we look on the forum but uh you've got a lot of experience in this and and, but we talked last week a little bit and you know you said your skill set what you don't know can kill you you know you you need to be aware of of the the temperature uh you know what you're wearing you know your gear there's so much that goes into this and that's let's use the rest of the show to kind of touch on this and start getting people uh educated a little bit about how do you go about getting prepared or telling somebody that wants to do cold water kayaking you know what where do you start with it yeah that's such a great topic and i could talk about it for a long time because there's a lot of facets so i'll start off by saying that everything that's dangerous about being on the water is magnified in the winter um it can be very very deadly something that could be a lot of fun in the summer could turn real scary real quick so the the general rule is you should never paddle in winter with less than three paddlers now, i don't always follow that rule again i'm not an instructor i'm not an expert I'm, I'm just a guy who paddles but the reason why you should always have three if something goes wrong with someone you've got two people to help and then if one of those people needs to go away and get help then you you have that option when you're on your own or even just with another friend all of those things that could go wrong kind of get magnified so when you're thinking about cold water paddling i don't suggest you try it alone in fact when i the first time i went out cold water paddling i was with 11 experienced people okay and so you know even i i didn't try it on my own um the other big thing is you have to be warm you know obviously you know and it's a lot harder to stay warm on the water so it's all about the clothing 
I did. I do have some stuff I can show you what I wear. Mm -hmm. Again, it's different for everybody, and, and you can experiment with different things. Um, and you also should always have um, backup clothes. Don't just go out there with what you're wearing. Always have something extra. I'm a dry suit guy. I'm not going to go out in winter without a dry suit. Now, a lot of people don't have a dry suit because they can be very expensive, and a lot of people find them uncomfortable. So there's other options, too, if you're not going to go out on big water. My general rule is if I'm in water over my head, I'm putting a dry suit on. Okay. So... Well, that makes um, perfect sense, right? And, and, and as Nancy points out, you dress for the water temperature, yes, not yes. the air temperature. Yeah, so, and that's the thing, um, definitely. You know, like right now, I'll just use the Detroit River as an example. It's about 38 degrees, that water. Obviously, it's freezing cold outside, but this is Michigan. It could be 50 in a couple of days, but that water temperature is still very cold. So, you, you know, I always tell folks to dress for immersion. Uh, we no. got got a piece of video here that shows uh, you talking about, you know, we're talking about cold water paddling, but also you can be, it can be cold or cool in the fall or the spring or even in, in the summer when it's raining and it, you can get in trouble. Yes. Yeah. So this, this, uh, that picture you just had up, that, that was a late summer day and it was quite cool and it, it was raining. And then what happened is this really dense fog moved in and just cut my visibility right down. You could see it starting to move in. Mm -hmm. I, I happen to know that stretch of water really well, so I knew what to do. But if I wasn't familiar with that, it would have been really easy to get disoriented. And, and hypothermia uh, can be a real uh, a real problem even in, in that type of weather, right? Yep, even in that type of weather. So this this video is just from I want to say about a month ago. So it was it was late fall, and it's on the Detroit River, um, going into right near Lake St. Clair. And I would say, you know, the waves were about a foot and a half. They weren't anything crazy, but real strong wind and current coming at me there. And I wanted to take a little video and I have the phone kind of secured on my deck with the handle of my bilge pump. So it's not going anywhere, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to show people, um, you know, what, what it can look like out there. Well, that, plus that also shows you uh, in typical Michigan fashion, how weather can also change yeah. as quickly as, you know, as the current can when you're, when you're out there, right? You get out yeah. there and it might be smooth and all of a sudden you get into something situation like this. And that's what happened. It started out smooth, but you just, you never know when you're on bigger water, especially like the Great Lakes or any of the, the larger connecting rivers that feed out into those Great Lakes, it can be very unpredictable. So you kind of have to, you got to make sure that you're prepared for, for all that, even if it doesn't happen. Well, talk a little bit about skill set as far as uh, when you go out, I, I got to assume you don't take out a, a, a new beginner kayaker in cold water. I mean, to me, that just, that doesn't seem like the smart thing to do. Right. Yeah. So I don't take any beginners out really at all in winter ever. I take uh, beginners out in the summer and on smaller water to get them used to it. I think if you're going to go in big water, you should definitely know how to do at least a wet exit and re-entry. So you should know how to fall out of your boat in such a way that you can get back in it. And there's different techniques and you should practice those techniques often, you know, with friends and even on your own, if you're able, I, I practice on my own and I practice with friends. So, um, especially if you're going to be out there solo, you need to know how to get back into your boat. If you're somewhere where you can't easily get to shore, as you can see here, you, you, I wouldn't be able to swim to shore mm -hmm. in, in any situation. So it's really important to know how to get back in that boat and then what to do when I'm in it, how to get the water out, you know, um, making sure that all my gear is secure to my boat. Another important safety thing in, on big water are these Marine radios. Mm -hmm. So, this thing here, you know, you can, it does a lot of things, but the most important thing on it is right here, this distress signal. You register this thing with the U.S. Coast Guard, and if all you do is press this button, it sends the Coast Guard your exact location. So it's so a it's GPS super, as yeah, well. I got gotcha. you. GPS enabled. And if you're with other paddlers and, you know, you have people that might be behind or go faster, you can communicate with them. You can also communicate with other ships. And you can get weather alerts, which is really important. I've been out there on a beautiful summer day on Lake Erie, 
And then all of a sudden this thing starts going crazy and it's the weather service saying there's a storm moving in. I've gotten off the water, secured my boat and walked back to my car before the thunderstorm started. There you go. And especially a Lake Erie is so shallow. Those waves come up quick, especially in a high wind situation with a storm. Yeah, Lake Erie is very can, can get very scary very quick because it is shallow. And a lot of people think because it's shallow, it's not as scary as like a Superior or a Huron. But like you said, when it's shallow like that and you get the long wind drafts that come across that lake, it gets nasty real quick. And yeah, like you said, it doesn't take long. I, I've heard of uh, people getting in, in bad situations, even like in a, a regular boat, you know, right. where, where, yeah. where they can get swamped out there. So uh, I tell you what, let's take another break. We come back, uh, we'll continue the conversation, and uh, let's talk a little bit maybe when we come back about uh, how you prepare or, as far as your, uh, your attire, layering up and things of that nature, and why that's important. Sounds great. All right, we're going to step outside, take our next break, and we'll be right back after this. PSC Archery has always dominated the speed category. Now, the most revolutionary cam system ever to hit the market has perfected the shooting experience. Introducing PSE's Evolve Cam System, featuring extremely high let-off capabilities and the smoothest draw cycle in history. No other cam system has ever delivered this level of total comfort and total control. Experience PSE. Experience performance. Welcome back. Third segment of the show, talking about some cold water kayak. And when we, before we went to the break, I said we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, you had mentioned that if you're in, in water over your head, cold water or big water, that you wear a dry suit. Yes. I've got a two-piece wetsuit that I use, and then I use a, like a water shedding light apparel over top of that uh, when it's a little cooler weather. Talk about what, you know, a wetsuit versus dry suit, you know, yeah. and how that all works. Great question. And again, these are just my opinions um, based on personal experience because sure. people feel different ways. But so a wetsuit, what a wetsuit does is a wetsuit traps a layer of moisture between your body and the neoprene and warms it to your body temperature. Mm -hmm. But you're wet. And in my opinion, a wetsuit is no good if that water temperature is under 55 degrees. You're going to freeze. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I always, you know, wetsuits are tricky. I wear them sometimes in the spring and the fall when that water temperature is greater than 55, but you're starting to see some cooler air temps. Okay. Um, but I want to talk about, if it's okay, my dry suit. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, so um, this dry suit that I have is 12 years old, and I've had it for six. So I bought it used. And they do require, you know, maintenance and, and things like that. But this one is a one-piece dry suit. It's by Coke Attack. You can tell I love their gear. Maybe they should they should pay me. Um, <laughs> they should. <laughs> but it's called the uh, it's called the Meridian, and it's a great dry suit. So you get into it from the front. It's got a front relief zipper. It's got solid booties on the bottom, and then it has these latex wrist gaskets and neck gaskets. So no water is going to get in here at all. It is tight on you. Okay. But it doesn't insulate you. You need to make sure that you layer underneath it. And again, that's different for everybody too. Um, you have to just experiment and get to know your, your body. If any of my friends are watching, they're going to laugh because they know how much I love this. This is a dry suit liner and it's called the Habanero. And it's like a onesie, okay. like what the old Union soldiers wore, you know, back right. in the day. Right. And this thing is extremely warm. So I wear this under the dry suit and you can layer with that. Anything that you wear on the water that I wear, it's non-cotton, it's wicking, and it's breathable. So okay. it's really important that you that you do that. And again, I always carry a bag of dry, a full bag of dry clothes in case the dry suit rips, something happens. I also like to carry always with me um, a paddle jacket that you can place over, over everything that you're mm -hmm. wearing to keep you warm and dry. That's huge. And then, you know, head, hands, and feet. That's huge, okay? Um, you want some really warm socks. Again, non-cotton, but you want like a thick, you know, this is, these are Carhartt socks, but mm -hmm. the brand doesn't matter. There's lots of brands out there, but this is um, like something that you would wear when you were going to go trekking in the woods in deep snow. You want a nice thick sock, and this is underneath the dry suit. And then over that, I wear 
these little booties and these are three millimeter neoprene mm -hmm. so they do insulate but again this my bare foot's not in here i'm inside the dry suit and then i'm inside a really warm sock and these are tight they're not going to come off like a boot will you know right. so that's important um for hands nancy's gonna love this i'm a big fan of pogies so pogies are these things that velcro onto the shaft of your paddle and your hand goes inside okay and they're they're extremely warm but the danger with pogies mike is if you fall out of the boat you got a bare hand in that icy in water. water right so i recommend that you wear a glove underneath the pogey as well mm -hmm. um a lot of my friends and i like these too they wear these toaster mitts they're called and it's just a mitten a neoprene mitten that you wear and it, there's a lot of mobility and flexibility so you can still grab things these are really great too um on my head i can't i don't i can't find it but i basically wear a they call it a balacava and it's just a really warm you know non-cotton um head headwear but you could wear a wool hat and again you always want backups because if you fall in the water and that wool hat comes off and floats down the river <laughs> right you yeah. want to have another one in your kayak so um i'm a big believer on kind of having at least two of everything right right you know, it makes it makes complete sense. You know, uh, something that Nancy had taught me this year is you, you carry backup paddles with you in case, yes. you, you know, you you roll and you lose a paddle, whatever you've got, or maybe you break a blade, you know, yes. what, what have you. Is that way you've got a backup. Uh, I've had that happen where I broke a paddle and thankfully I had another one on deck and, you know, it's it's mm -hmm. always good to, to have that just for the reasons that you said. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So you, you broke a paddle. One of the questions coming from Sherry David is i was wondering about mike's worst paddling experience or has it all been smooth paddling uh, i i know i don't know sherry personally but she always comments on my <laughs> my posts in one of the groups so hi sherry um i can share my worst paddling experience because i think about it a lot whenever the water gets rough i was paddling in the detroit river where it meets lake erie you know it goes into the lake there and often we get a south wind that comes up the river. So you have wind going against current and it creates these crazy waves. And um, I was out with some friends and it was around this time of year and around this temperature. And I was pretty new at kayaking. I'd only been doing it for a year and I was in that blue boat. I was in the tsunami and we were crossing the river and the waves were hitting the side of the boat. You know, these were probably three foot waves. And what you're supposed to do when that happens is you lean into the wave because the wave's trying to push you over and your natural instinct is just to go with it. So you're leaning into it. And I, I used to do this thing when I'd get scared where I would just paddle really fast. You know, let's say call it panic paddling when the water would get rough. But that became a problem because I get so far ahead of the group that the more experienced paddlers lost sight of me. And if I go in the water, it's going to take them longer to get to me. So that was a scary experience. I didn't go over, but I thought that I was going to. The waves were, were like I said, three foot high and coming in very fast, too. So you don't have a breather. You just have to keep paddling. And um, I had to make sure that my anxiety didn't get so bad that I freaked out and lost my balance. Okay, speaking of a situation like that, it makes me think of, uh, along with cold water paddling, spray skirt. Uh, to me, it just yeah. would make sense that you would have something like that uh, to help keep that water from getting into the compartment as well. Yep. Very important always, piece of gear. Always have a spray skirt on um, when you're in the bigger water, definitely, um, to keep those waves out for sure. Um, it's, it's a really important piece of gear. It also helps insulate you in the boat. Um, uh, one skill that I haven't learned yet is I don't know how to roll, but people that roll, you know, a skirt's important as well to keep the water out. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely an essential piece of gear. Like I said, it keep for me, it keeps the waves out of the boat, the water out of the boat, and it keeps you extra warm inside that boat as well, too. All right. And, and, and you talked about bringing extra clothes, you know, when you go out. Um, where would be the best place to store them? Inside the bulkhead or behind the seat? Where would yep, be the that's best? a great question. So I always keep all of my extra clothes in a dry bag, right, just in case. But I put them in the bulkhead in the kayak, too. So it's like they're dry. They're not going anywhere. And they're in a big bag that floats if it falls in the water. Okay. So, so, so that way, you know, you, you got it with you right there. Yep. Looks like Mike might be grabbing he, a dry bag. He, I don't know. He just... Does that to me every once in a while, and I he, he thought I, I was taking off here. I had to get something here. Let me get back on camera. 
Dry yep. bag. Yep. This is this. So, you know, one I one. have one real similar to that. And in it, I have a full change of non cotton clothes. I mean, underwear, socks, pants, shirt, a hat, gloves, towel, hot hands, you know. And I also always have a hot thermos of water oh on the deck of the boat. And the reason for that is if water goes on those hatches, they can freeze shut. So it's important that, you know, if you have some hot water, you can pour over there to break the ice to get in your hatches. I never thought about that. Yeah. that's. I've, I've been on the water before and had waves. I mean, we were out uh, goose hunting and got frozen because the water was splashing up on the boat and we were against the shore and my outboard motor froze in the upright position. <laughs> and I'm like, what do we do now? Right. <laughs> but, well, uh, yeah, that never thought about that. That That's a good point. And, and you know, and, and Kelly Rudolph points it out that uh, uh, to put it in perspective when you're out on the water, uh, that a three-foot wave is over a paddler's head. And when that happens, you cannot see your friends when you're in the bottom of a Right. And when you're on the top of it, your paddle probably doesn't hit the water <laughs> when you're trying to paddle. <laughs> That's that's quite a ways, but uh, what about mylar emergency blankets? Those are nice to have too. I didn't bring it in the room with me, but I have the uh, I have something. Um, oh my gosh, the name's escaping me. Gosh, I can't think of what it what it's called, but it's basically a, a, a garment that I wear that you can wear that fits right over your PFD, right over your dry suit, and um, it'll keep you warm. Storm cag, it's called a storm cag, and so that's within reach in a dry bag if I need it. But an emergency blanket is a great thing to have too. They're very cheap. You can throw a couple in your boat. I carry a first aid kit um, in the boat and there's all sorts of stuff in here. Obviously there's Tylenol and Motrin, but there's also uh, Vaseline, medical grade tape, the little hot hands things. I'm always adding stuff to it. Um, The other thing, anything that you put on your boat, like on the deck, I always have a bottle of water. You always want to attach it to the deck lines. That way, if you go over, you don't lose it. Everything, you shouldn't have anything loose. Even my, this goes inside my life jacket, but it clips onto the life jacket too. Because, you know, any if you go over or drop something and it's not attached to you, you're going to lose that. Well, speaking of going over, cold water. I, yeah. Okay, <laughs> even, even if you've got your, your, your dry suit on, you got all yeah. your gear on, I mean, we've all seen the videos, people fall in the water. I mean, you, you instantly go, you know, you pretty much go into cold water shock. Yeah, uh, and you, I've had it happen to a friend. Okay. Um, so what happens to your body when it hits cold water is you do this thing. It's called the, the cold shock response, and you can't even help it. Your body immediately wants to go <gasps> as soon as it feels that cold water. And you know what happens if you do that? You're going to swallow water. Mm-hmm. So... It's really important. One of the things that I, this is just me, what I always do when I'm paddling in cold water, I always get in my boat in the water anyway, but I like to feel that water. I like to either stick my hands in or put my legs in it just to give, to remind me how cold that water is. So I had a friend go over in winter, not sharing names or anything because he's probably listening. And he went into shock when he hit that cold water. His entire body seized up and he froze. He wasn't moving. Because that water was so cold, it just, it put him right into shock. So, um, again, it's why I really, I I know I'm I'm going against my own advice, but I don't recommend that you go out alone in cold water. If you do, you are taking a risk and you have to know that. Mm -hmm. You know, I I know that I'm taking that risk and I choose to do that, but it it could be a, it, it could turn from a really fun day into a deadly day really quick. And it happens so quick. Um, you know, it, okay, so we've fallen overboard. We're in the water. We went into cold water shock. Yeah. You, you've got your two paddle buddies with you uh, because, like you said, you don't go out alone. You know, you take, right. you try to take, you know, more than one person with you. Yeah. At that point, okay, so one guy's going to try to stay safe and maybe call for emergency help if you need it. The other guy's right. trying, or gal is trying to get that person out of the water back into their boat if they can't. Right. Uh, let's say we're we're on a river. And we can get to shore, we, we, we get them to shore, get their gear to shore. What's that next step? What do we need to do to, to make sure they're going to survive? Get them warm immediately. Um, if they're wearing a dry suit, don't take it off. Hopefully it's not leaking. Um, I recommend taking, and, and I've done this, you know, take all of your emergency clothes, blankets, everything out and cover the person up. Lay on top of them if necessary. If you have that hot thermos of water, 
get that in them, get anything you can in them, get them some food, a granola bar, anything to get their body temperature up. That's the most important thing is getting them warm again. Um, some people carry things to start a small fire, you know, that would work too. Mm -hmm. But if you're able to get them out and walk them on to, you know, walk out of the water and get them on shore, you, you just want to get them warm first and foremost. If you're out on big water, you want to get them back in that boat as quick as possible. And that's a whole nother podcast and discussion that, you know, the, the <laughs> assisted rescue and things like that. Um, but that's the goal is get them back in the boat and paddling again so they warm up. Well, yeah. that, well that, that plus, you know, that's where those um, chemical hand warmers come in to, to play too, right? Those are sealed. You break those out and you just start using those as well. Definitely, yeah. And again, they're cheap. They're plentiful. I just always have them with my gear in the boat. You know, and, and something we haven't mentioned uh, that I carry with me every time I go, whether it's a river or on the lake, uh, you mentioned getting them back in the boat if you're on big water. You need to make sure you've got uh, a hand pump as well so you can pump that, that cockpit dry or get the water, yeah. most of the water out so you can actually get the thing back up right again. Yeah, everybody should have one of these and you want to have it in on the deck, accessible or behind your seat, somewhere where you can grab it. You don't want to put it in the hatch. Right. It's got to be somewhere where you can grab it. I also recommend a paddle float. This is a nice self-inflatable one. You blow into it and you put this on your paddle and this will just help, you know, give you some leverage to get back in the boat. But two two essentials that I always have in the cockpit with me when I'm paddling. Okay. I'll tell you what, we've uh, we've used up another 15 minutes here. We're going to take our last break. We come back, we'll, we'll kind of touch up on a couple things that maybe you want to mention for people who are thinking about going out cold water paddling and uh, then we'll wrap up the show. So we're going to step outside. We'll be right back after this. Acceleration is part of PSE's DNA. PSE pioneered the speed movement. Now they've developed the vapor category to help you find the most powerful bows on the market to fit you. High speed equates to intense power and building the momentum you need to be successful. Are you a vapor shooter? Find out at PSEArchery.com. Welcome back. Last part of the show. Uh, we'll spend another 15 minutes or so here uh, trying to help people out to understand uh, and take seriously how cold water can be uh, fun, but it can also be uh, very dangerous and, as well. And it can happen in seconds. Ab absolutely. Um, you know, when we go out in the summer, and i got to imagine in the winter, it's just as important, we haven't talked about it yet, is a float plan and letting somebody who is at home, on shore, on dry land, know where you're at, where you're putting in, and where you're supposed to be getting out in an approximate time. Yeah, that's huge. Uh, always leave a float plan, you know, particularly in winter. But, you know, for me personally, um, someone always knows where I'm going, how long they expect me to be. Um, you know, all, all of those things. I check in before I paddle. I check in after I paddle. Um, and of course, I always have my cell phone and the backup communication, the marine radio. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I say I'm going to be out for four hours and it's been four hours, my phone starts ringing. You know, where are you? Is everything OK? <laughs> right. That's that's happened to me before. So but a flow plan is so important. The other thing I wanted to talk about is putting one of these stickers in your boat. You can get these at a lot of places. Uh, Coast Guard Auxiliary. A lot of the local kayaking stores have them. Kelly Rudolph in our chat, she has these. So she said anybody wants them, you can just contact her. But what this is, it's a sticker that you put inside of your boat with your name and your phone number. Because, you know, if you become separated from your boat and that mm -hmm. boat is found later, then it makes it easier for them to, to, to get it to you. And if the Coast Guard sees a boat floating out in the water, they're going to assume that something bad's happened. So if there's a way, you know what I mean? Cause they right. don't know. Like, yeah, right. Um, and, and, and the other thing, if somebody, if somebody's rescuing you like uh, from a, a boat or something, a lot of times they can't get your kayak. They may just leave it. Their, their, their priority is getting you safe. And so it's just an important way to um, have your boat labeled so they can get a hold of you and know that, yeah, I lost that or, or, or whatever, you know, it blew away, it got away from me kind of. Thing. Yeah. Well, Danny, if we take you out, I'm going to put one of them stickers on you. That way, if you get lost, we will somebody finds you and they'll know how to get you back home. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Absolutely, and, and it's good to know Nancy Jackson is spending money left and right right now. That's right. She said this uh, this broadcast has cost her a lot of money, and so. she's already placed orders. So, <laughs> oh lord, 
You know, and I think it's important, you guys, to to say to people too, like cold water paddling isn't for everyone, and and that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't. Not everybody has to go out because it it is very dangerous. It can be a lot of fun, but it can also be very dangerous. And so I always tell people, don't feel like you have to go out. You can wait until it's warmer. It it's it's not for everyone. So, um, but if you are going to go out, you should definitely have a little bit of an idea of what you're doing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like we said at the beginning of the show, it's not for beginners. You know, it, it, it you need to have some kind of a sense of the water uh, and have a skill set to be able to go out there before you, you tackle that cold water. I mean, you know, we, we've been out duck hunting uh, and we do it in the worst weather. It's raining. It's cold, snowing, breaking ice. And it's the same thing. I mean, this isn't just for people who are kayaking. I mean, it can be for, you know, like we said, ice fishermen, you know, taking that extra gear with you to stay warm, Uh, a dry bag. It doesn't weigh that much. Put it in your jet sled. You know, people who are out duck hunting, same thing. Take some extra clothes and put them in a dry bag. And unfortunately, you're probably going to hear it that, we lose a couple of duck hunters because They've, something I, happened. Hypothermia. It happens a lot. You know, I, a friend of mine had a storm roll in, and they had to stay on an island out. I want to say it was out near Charity Islands. Anyway, long story short, it was cold, wet, rainy. They had to sleep under the boat overnight and build a fire there to, just to stay warm. And it was one of them situations where some of this stuff we're talking about could actually uh, help save you. You know, the radio you talked about, Mike, that, that's imperative of having something like that if you're out there in bad weather. Uh, yeah. I, use, uh, I use a little app on mine, uh, and we talked about here on the show, Base Map. And what they've come up with here recently on this app is a, a rescue beacon. You know, it's, I know you're not going to be able to see it here right now, and I'm getting people hit me up real quick. But in the in the tools menu, there there's an icon here that says SOS, and you tap that. It's the right. same thing like you said, it, it, it GPS locator, and it yeah. sends that beacon out. And I know they have the handheld ones as well, yeah. plus the, the radio that you have that's invaluable as well. A couple things to think about about the phone that I, that I always tell people, too. Don't rely solely on the phone for a couple of reasons. One, the cold kills that battery real quick. Absolutely. Right? Mm-hmm. Two, you could drop it. Your hands are wet and slippery. And three, I, I can't always get my phone to work when my hands are wet. So right. it's, a, it's a great tool, but I always say have another tool, too. You know, have, have a radio as well. Again, on, on the bigger water, you're not going to need this when you're going down, you know, a creek or a back river or whatever right but when you're going out on big water you definitely want to have that backup communication well you got to be prepared for your situation yeah yep yep be prepared for the worst and hope for the best that's what i like to say so um you know we got a few minutes left here is there anything that you can think of that we haven't covered that maybe something that uh, that you wanted to cover in in the chat tonight uh you know i'm sure i forgot something i do have a question yeah you know you talked about uh the dry suit and layering underneath there okay so you're paddling and you sound like a pretty fast paddler. So you're going to generate. How should should when you're doing that? Should you be worried about dehydration? Well, I always have water. You want to stay hydrated, especially in the cold weather. You don't think about how hydration as much. I always carry this uh, 32 ounces of water on the deck, but I always have another 32 ounces in the back. I very rarely drink it, but I almost always drink this. So depending on how long I'm out there, I drink a lot of water anyway. And yeah, when you're paddling hard, you're, you're sweating and you're, you're working. So it's important to make sure you stay hydrated. And also food. I always have in the, in the life jacket, I always have granola bars, nuts, something like that that I can eat. And I always have some sort of hot food in the boat. I carry an insulated little lunch um, thermos and I'll have soup in there or just just some kind of food so I can stop and get some some food in me because that's important too. All right. You know, we always ask a bunch of que- or four questions to our, our guests, first time guests, uh, which we're probably not going to be able to get to tonight. But you mentioned food and you mentioned drink. And I actually, I kind of told you we were going to ask something similar along these lines towards the end of the show. So one of the questions we always ask is, you know, talking about a favorite meal or something like that. But when you're in the boat, uh, what's what's your go-to snack? What, what do you got? You got to have in that boat or your kayak every single time you go out. It's like, I've got to have that snack. What is it? I'm pretty a simple guy. It's usually some sort of trail mix. 
you know, something sweet and salty, something with like nuts and M&Ms and raisins in there. Because it's just real high energy food. Mm -hmm. It's easy to eat. I, you know, I don't even have to stop the boat. <laughs> right. Gotcha. What, yeah. Okay. So what about uh, what about a shore lunch? You guys do shore lunches or do you eat yeah. on the go? No, we stop and have a lunch. And if it's real cold, it's a quick lunch. But, <laughs> you know, uh, my my go to is I usually do some sort of little box. I, I love a ham sandwich, you know, and some chips and then a little veggies and fruit. And I always bring extra food. I very rarely eat all the food that I bring. But the reason why is you never know if something happens and you're going to be out there longer. Right. There's been a couple of times where, you know, something happened and you're out there longer. Food is fuel. So you need to make sure that you stay fueled when you're doing these physical activities. See, Danny, he brings extra food for people. Not you. <laughs> you, you should bring me some extra I food know. when you go out. And, we, and, we, and when we talked before the show, we found out that you really like venison. Yes, I love venison. So, yeah. I can ask this question, is what is your favorite venison? How would you like it? Oh, man, the best, in, in my opinion, is I take backstrap steak and I just uh, fry it up in the uh, cast iron pan with some butter and olive oil, a little salt and pepper for about 30 seconds on each side. And it's good to go. There you go. See, yeah. keep it simple. Don't put a lot of stuff on it. Good to go. I like it. Usually how it works the best. That's right. <laughs> just so everybody knows, uh, we talked about this a little bit before the show. We're going to try to get this guy out and do a little hunting maybe this year. Well, we better not take Nancy because she says she's an expert snacker. That's right. <laughs> Got to have snacks on the road while you're going kayaking to your spot. Got to have snacks on the way home, but you also have snacks in the boat. So I will say, she comes more prepared for, for floats than I do. Uh, I leave it up to her to, to pack the lunches and everything. She does a great job at that. I've never, ever been thirsty or hungry on a paddle. So That's great. She's really good at that. So She says you paddle so slow, she <laughs> eats her food too fast. I like to enjoy the float. I, okay, so you paddle a lot down the Detroit River, and we've seen some of the pictures and some of the scenic places that you go. When you're out with a group of people, and you're, you're hitting some of those spots that you've been to before. Are, are you a fast paddler? Do you like, come on, let's go, let's go? Or are you the kind of guy that likes to drift along a little bit and, and just take it in and see the sights? When I'm with other people, I always go the speed of the group. And I'm not insulting anybody, but it's usually a lot slower than I would go. When I'm on my own, I'm flying. That's just what I like to do. But when I'm with other people, it's social. I love history. I love Detroit history. And I love talking about all the things on the river. And at, you can ask my friends. I'm always going on and on, whether they want to hear it or not, pointing things out, pointing animals out. So that's kind of, when I'm with the group, I don't leave anybody behind. E even the slowest paddler, not just for safety, but also it's a social thing. You know, you're hanging out with your friends and spending time together. So especially during the pandemic when we really couldn't do anything, we could still paddle. So there were people that that was our thing. You know, we hung out while we were kayaking. Yeah, we got a picture up here right now. You've got a good group of people. Looks like it's a Santa hat paddle. Oh, yeah, that was our Christmas lights paddle. Yeah, we do that. Um, you know, we've done that for a couple of years now. We decorate the boats and that crew there, that's my regular crew of friends. They're all highly skilled, much more skilled than I am. Um, but we have, a, we have a great time when we hang out. Lots of laughs, lots of good food and um, just good energy with each other. There you go. That's what it's all about. Yeah. <laughs> no more brownies, by the way. There, there's got to be an inside joke about that. There, oh right? yeah, there, there's an inside joke that's probably not for tonight. <laughs> gotcha, I gotcha. So you've been like the energi energizer bunny on speed. <laughs> <laughs> he does fly. Uh -huh. Yeah, you're getting a reputation there, bud. Yeah, it, it, they're they're hammering you right now on the on the forum or the chat room here. Okay, hey, before we go, uh, we've got to get in your uh, your what your Facebook page because that's actually how we found out about you was through your your Facebook group. So yeah, before we go, uh, how can people find you there on that? Definitely. So look up the group. It's called Paddling Michigan Lakes and Rivers. It's a great group. Uh, we've got, I don't know how many people in there now. Nancy does a really good job as moderator. It's a fun group. It's, you know, no judgment. I started it basically so people could meet each other and get to know each other, ask for advice. I've made a lot of good friends out of there. Um, and yeah, it's for anybody who's, even people that aren't in Michigan. We have Ohio people there. We have some of our friends from Canada in there. It's, it's a really nice group of people. 
Um, so paddling Michigan lakes and rivers. You know, what I like about people, uh, you know, if you need uh, help on a river, you know, it's like, well, what do you think about this river? Where's a good put in place or a takeout or how long did it take you to paddle it? Or even recommendation on, on a river to hit. Uh, and, and the pictures that people post, it's just incredible of some of the things that we get to see on that forum. Yeah. And you got, a, a, and you got about 1,400 people in that group. 1,400 now. That's nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy that it's grown so much. I Like I said, I just, and I'm not putting down any other kayak groups. There's a lot of them out there. But I wanted one that did not have a lot of rules and no judgment and, you know, just fun. Well, it's the way it should be. You know, yeah. it, I mean, that's what we all do this for. So if we're not having fun at it, we give up. Right, right. So, exactly. uh, you know, we got uh, we got a couple minutes here left before we have to uh, wrap things up. Um, just trying to think uh, what what is the, the the coolest place that you've paddled? I mean, wh- what stretch or or something that sticks in your mind? It's like that's that's my, yeah. my number one. I can tell you exactly. My favorite place, and I, I still have a lot of places I want to paddle, but my favorite place in the whole world to paddle is in the lower Detroit River near Bablo Island. Um, there's several islands in the river there, and there's a place called Crystal Bay, and it's um, kind of blocked off by limestone rocks that were placed there when they dredged the freighter channel, and the water is crystal clear and deep. And, and, and Crystal Bay has all these hidden little lakes in it. And you feel like you're up north. You don't feel like you're in Detroit. Mm. It's super peaceful and quiet. You can look out and see Lake Erie. And I just, I love it down there. That's my go-to spot. Um, and then also, um, my second would probably be Belle Isle. I love to go around Belle Isle. It's a great workout. And you get to see the city of Detroit. And it's just fun exercise. Yeah, and it, it, like you said, exercise, that's another great thing about it is uh, you get a good workout. Yeah. You know, especially on, uh, on, on rivers that don't have a lot of current. Uh, I know Nancy and I, we paddled uh, the Big Man of Steam. We did 17 miles on that and out to Lake Michigan. And I want to tell you what, it, there was current, but it wasn't very much. And 17 miles is long, a lot of paddling. I was wore out by the time we got done with that one. Yeah. It doesn't, uh, it'll wear you out quick. So, Dan, you got anything else? No, I just thought uh, Nancy telling uh, hashtag get off my river. <laughs> hey, the river's for everyone. I, you know, she, I see she asked a question about sharing the rivers with fly fishermen. Yeah. You know, the beautiful thing about the water, it belongs to all of us. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I'm always, when I see fishermen, I try to stay out of their way. I always look for their lines. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've never had to cut them. I always carry a knife in the life jacket just in case but you know you know if you get, they'd be mad if you did it but if you get tangled or something but it's you know okay i'm glad, just, I'm glad you clarified what you're gonna use the knife for yeah yeah um so like i said the water's for everyone yep. and I, tr- I try to share the water with everybody and you know again this would be a whole nother podcast but i could tell you about all the crazy power boaters and stuff like that mm-hmm. and the things that they shouldn't do but yep. i just feel like in a kayak we can set a good example by by sharing the river and just being nice to other people yeah you know my, my standard rule of thumb and talking about uh you know fishermen fly fishermen or what have you because we do a lot of uh paddling on the asable and when when i i see a fisherman ahead you know i'm like hey right or left you know what side do you want me to go on you know and and let them dictate where they want what, what side they want me on you know because i don't want to bust a hole on them you know and I, that's what i tell them i said like, you know i don't want to hit your hole where you're you're casting to so you tell me where do you want me but there are some people that are a little standoffish and and you know you just have to like you said they don't want to share uh as, as well at times so you know we just have to deal with that yeah so you know and uh can't we all get along? Well, yeah, you know, and, and <laughs> I will say, river. coming from a hunting and, and, and fishing perspective, and this is no way knocking any group or anybody, but, you know, we as kayakers, really the only fees that we have to pay is our recreational fee of getting into, uh, you know, in and out of a boat launch, you know, on our, our vehicle. Uh, you know, there are, I, I have heard there's a couple rivers where you have to have a permit here in Michigan. Yeah, yeah, there is. Yeah. You know, so I understand that, but for the most part, uh, the hunters and fishermen uh, of this state, you know, with their license fees, uh, pay for quite a bit of yeah. Michigan's natural resource. You know, so, yeah. uh, I mean, I pay my fair share. I mean, it's a lot of money every year <laughs> right. in license fees, but you know, so we got to remember that as well too, that, you know, we get to use these resources and it really doesn't cost us a whole lot. So exactly. So. Yeah. So hats off to those guys for helping us out. So. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, a lot of respect for our outdoorsmen, our hunter, hunters and fishermen and women, too. Yep, absolutely. So I tell you what, we're uh, 
Yeah, we're wrap right here. We ought to wrap up the show. Like I said, we could touch on so many other subjects, but it's just a kind of an introductory level to some cold water paddling. There's some things that you need to think about before you just, you know, hey, I'm just going to jump in and I'm going to take the kayak and I'm going to paddle this stretch of river and I'm not going to tip over. Well, yeah, well, that's when it all goes wrong. Knock on wood, you know, uh, it happens. I, I, I almost lost uh, a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine that I work with about uh, eight, nine years ago. Quick story, uh, him and his son got in kayaks at a friend's house and I don't remember what river it was. It was up north. There was a foot of snow on the ground and he, he dumped and wow. lost the kayak and nearly drowned. Uh, he got caught in a log jam and, and pulled himself up out of it, get out on the opposite side of the river as to where the cabin they were staying in and had to walk, lost both boots, and had to walk in a foot of snow about a mile back upstream to get help. Wow, so, that's scary. So, you know, don't just think you can hop in and go. And he learned a valuable lesson. And he's still got frostbite. He's lost uh, feeling in, in his fingers uh, to this day, so... It can happen, people. So just be safe out there. Uh, yeah. Any, any close, anything closing that you want to say before we, we wrap up? Just thank you so much for having me on the show. Uh, hopefully the, the viewers enjoyed it. And I would encourage everybody to, to join that uh, Facebook group because there's so many great experts. There are people um, like Kelly and other friends of mine that are certified instructors and trainers and are very passionate about safety and they're willing to, to help anybody out. So I would recommend to, to join that group, Paddling yep. Michigan Lakes and Rivers. We got uh, we got the name of it up right now here on the Facebook page. So uh, make sure you go over and check that out and join. I'm telling you, it's a great bunch of people over there. And uh, we're going to sign off now. But uh, Mike, when we get done, hang on. We'll, we'll chat a little bit here right after the show. But for those of you who are listening on the podcast, uh, as we've always said here before, you know, go over to iTunes if you're listening on iTunes. Give us a review. It helps us, helps the people who support us as well. And, uh, you know, take and share the show, if you would, on your social media pages. Make sure you go over to Mike's social media pages. Give him a like, follow, share as well, and, and ours as well, if you would, please. And for those of you who are watching the show, we ask the same thing. You know, this is some great information. Hopefully, somewhere down the road, it keeps somebody from losing their life. I mean, that's the important thing. We want everybody to have fun, but you need to be safe out there. So, uh, and before we wrap up here, Danny, next week... You have the author from the book that you were reading? Bill Frederick from... Uh, the hunting, the hunting cabin or the hunting camp. I got the book. It's somewhere here in the house. I don't have it with me, but we're going to have Bill on next week, uh, author of that book that we've been promoting. He's going to come on. We're going to talk about his hunting camp uh, and the whole history behind that and how he got to write the book. And, and obviously, we're going to talk about what's in the book as well. So All right. Sounds like a fun evening. So next Thursday night, 730, make sure you tune in. But uh, that's going to do it for this week. Mike, once again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Great information. And uh, we, we got to get you on again here soon. Thanks, guys. I like that. All right. Take care, and uh, we'll see everybody here next week. This episode was brought to you by PSE Archery, Yamaha Outboards, Better the Hunt, Easy Cut, Packer Max, Deer Camp Coffee, Buck Baits, JPO Game Calls, Limwalker Game Calls, Wild Seasoning, Total Peep, Sunrise Archery, Scent Lock, and Scent Blocker. Thanks for listening, and join us again here next week. Until then, remember, as we always like to say, if you're out on the water or in the woods, shoot straight and be safe until next week on the Up North Journal.